Hello, I'm Tom Martin from the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'm joined today with Blood Cancers Today Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Sagar Loniel of the Winship Cancer Institute in Emory, Dr. Shambhavi Richard of the Center of Excellence for Multiple Myeloma in the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York, and Dr. Peter Voorhees of the Levine Cancer Institute in North Carolina. And this is our first roundtable of um, discussion on BCMA targeted CAR T cell therapy. Uh, doc, Dr. Richard, so so Peter t uh, said a few things about what um, you know, there are other options out there. So when you see a patient and you have a, the option now of a bispecific T cell engager or a CAR T cell therapy, how do you choose between those two? Yeah, I think this this question now is becoming very key. We actually had a publication from our institution. Uh, by Oliver Van Oakland in, in blood this year that looked at outcomes of salvage treatments and from two institutions, Mount Sinai and from Memorial. There were 79 patients on this uh, with a median follow-up of 21.3 months. And um, long story short, T-cell engaging therapy has, are really head and shoulders above other standard of care approaches in terms, and no matter what line of therapy post relapse after CAR-T you use them. So, um, um, so, you know, and uh, especially intuitively, it makes sense to try to switch targets. So if a patient is at all a clinical trial candidate, then I try to do that with one of the uh, bispecifics, and we have several uh, in our clinical trial armamentarium to see if they would fit um, one of those. Um, we do have um, tech commercially approved. I tend to not use that immediately after failure from a BCMA unless I can prove that, you know, it's been a long time since their CAR-T or some such thing. But other options that I have used very effectively are Selenexer and Selenexer-based regimens. So that's another thing as a bridge. It may not last indefinitely, but people have been able to stay on it for like at least six months or so post CAR-T relapse. And so I have tried that. Um, you know, if they have it 1114, then I try to use a venetoclax, uh, you know, base regimen. Uh, so these are some of the various things uh, that I've tried. And if not, actually, another thing that I've really used, especially for patients who are relapsing aggressively is a transplant based approach. So BCNUML followed by a stem cell boost really does have pretty good response rates, even in the post CAR T relapse. And uh, it's a it's a great temporizing measure um, before getting them on to something else. So back, back to big alkylator if needed to salvage the people. Okay. So, you know, just the way the CAR T-cell therapeutics work, we obviously have to uh, harvest some T-cells and then we send them out for manufacturing. And these days it can take anywhere between six and eight weeks before you get the, the product back to be infused. And so we have to keep the patient stable during that period of time. Uh, Sagar, what do you guys use um, at Emory for bridging-based therapy? Is there any is there any um, best best regimen in your guys' hands? Yeah, you know, I think bridging is really the variable that we don't talk a lot about um, because it can impact the response rate post car and it can impact the toxicity post car as well. And certainly in the early trials, whether it's karma or cartitude. Um, these are patients with large tumor burden, unlikely to respond to any bridging that we were allowed to give on the trial. Yet there was a big difference in response to bridging between the silta cell early trials and the karma trials, with almost nobody responding to bridging in the early Ida cell trials and a much larger proportion responding in the silta cell trials, which tells you that while we add up resistance to X, Y, and Z and lines of therapy, that there are differences between these patient populations that we need to take into account. And, and, and I think when we think about bridging, the ideal case is that we don't bridge at all. That to me is the best case scenario. And so to speak to what uh, Pete and Shambhavi were talking about before, in, an, in a newly diagnosed patient that has had a good response, no bridging is a, is a much more doable proposition because they're pan sensitive and you likely have a good disease status when you go in. However, many of our patients don't have that as a luxury, even in second or third relapse where their disease is marching at a pretty significant rate. And so, um, you know, uh, as, as Dr. Voorhees suggested, our last choice is DSEP or chemotherapy based approaches. We'll recycle things that we've done before, um, you know, find whatever you haven't used or a combination you haven't used. 
one thing that we often go back to in the bridging context is a lot of patients have seen carfilzomib in combinations, but they got low doses of carfilzomib at, tw at 27 or 36. I go back to 56 twice a week um, and combine it with something in that context. And 56 twice a week is able to overcome car resistance at the lower doses um, a, a significant number of times. So that's often an, an approach we take. But, you know, a question I was actually curious uh, for both Pete and Shambhavi is in those earlier relapse trials that you mentioned, we're, we're comparing PFS between two products, but the rates of bridging may have been different between those two products as well, which tells you about the tempo the patients are bringing into their relapse. Um, I know you guys each covered those early relapse trials. Were they similar? Were they dissimilar? I, I'm curious. I'm taking you off script here, Tom. Um, you know, you're definitely right, because that bridging thing did, uh, you know, make a considerable difference. Now, I haven't looked specifically at the data to see, you know, where exactly these patients were at at their various phases when they went into this. But I think if we take it down to real world now, as the way we use the Abecma and the Carvicti, we have now our own uh, control group, and uh, we treat them very similarly in terms of trying to bridge them to really minimize the tumor burden prior to. And, um, you know, I, I think that these questions will just become clearer as we go along. But I think there, you know, being equal, I mean, trying to level this playing field, I still think that with the Silta cell, that, that different car construct probably is the reason for getting those more improved you know, progression-free survivals, and we're still seeing that. I was just going to say on the Karma 3 trial, um, I'll actually need to, to, to dig down deep uh, into the manuscript to, to look at the bridging therapy and the response to bridging therapy. But Sagar, to your point, you're absolutely correct. You know, I think that you know, it, it, we're always, you know, um, you know, in dangerous waters when we're comparing across trials. And I think as we move the CAR T cell products into earlier lines of therapy, there's going to be more variables that could significantly impact longitudinal outcomes for these. So we'll need to look at those very carefully when we're making uh, conclusions about whether one is better than the other. Yeah, it, in you know, it's a race to the plateau, right? It's a race to see that who can actually generate a very long-term response, and that's really financially that becomes very a very successful therapy because the more patients are off therapy, the more savings there are from from myeloma therapeutics.